Hello and welcome to another episode of Our Brothers Creed podcast where we talk about motivation, experiences, and exploring the world around us. We're the Thomas Brothers and I'm Jared. I'm Ethan. Today we're going to be talking about some unique military weapons, tactics, and strategies that we thought were really cool. We wanted to stay away from things that were particularly like, oh, this is a cool gun or this is a cool whatever. We're talking more strategies and and things that are unique to wartime that uh, a lot of people don't know about. So it's going to be a really good episode. Let's do it. Spartans, what is your profession? Any man who must say I am the king is no true king. What I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare. If I can change and you can change, everybody can change. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world. All right. So the first one I want to get into today with these unique military strategies and tactics. So uh, the first one I want to talk about is uh, it's a group of soldiers called the, the Arditi. And the Arditi means the daring ones. And these were a group of volunteer soldiers um, in the Italian army during World War I that were known for um, extreme uh, hand-to-hand combat. And their whole purpose was to uh, attack, uh, this is trench warfare in World War I, mm-hmm. and there, after they had a big barrage of artillery, these Arditi soldiers would come in. They were like the commandos of the Italian army. They would come in with a knife between their teeth and a grenade in each hand, and they would storm the um, the opposing side's uh, trench. And their whole thing was to um, clear the trenches and hold the trenches until supporting uh, forces could come in and take it over. These are the these are the tip of the spear guys, man. Yeah, and so um, let's see. It says uh, they got their name from the uh, Royal Italian Army in 1917, um, where they were uh, engaging with vicious hand-to-hand combat and swift tactical movements. So. These Arditi soldiers, they were volunteers chosen from the most courageous of men and considered to be Italian's most elite uh, soldier during World War I. Uh, the Arditi organization was much smaller than normal infantry units. Um, it, considered, it consisted of five officers, 41 NCOs, and 150 men. Uh, the unique strategy replied, relied heavily on surprise, speed, and and uh, stealth, as their strategy was to advance toward the oppo- advance towards the opposition behind a curtain of Allied artillery fire. Um, once the bombardment of that artillery ceased, the men would charge forward into the enemy trenches, armed only with daggers in their teeth and grenades in their hands, and a goal of clearing and holding the newly earned position until relief troops arrived. So they didn't obviously fight with the deck. They'd chuck their grenades and then stab people. Yeah. So this, clear the air. Yeah. So they wouldn't... So at some points in the war, they did... There was some units that had like uh, very small kind of machine guns or a couple shot firearms, but it was just like because it's trench warfare, mm-hmm. everything was so close combat that long guns and rifles and stuff like that. And this was World War One. Yeah. It just didn't... It just didn't work. Um, so basically the, the grenades that they had were more like modern day flashbangs than they were like frack grenades. Oh, really? Frag yeah. Grenades, yeah. Frag grenades. So, uh, due to their outstanding production, they were paid almost three times the regular army, the, what the regular army received. Well, due, to the, due to the risk level as well, you know? Yeah. Um, and then after a while, they were actually so good and they would just go in and slaughter everybody that they actually, the, the army created a bonus system, uh, was employed to take enemy prisoners. So you would get 10 lear, I think is the, is the, uh, Italian currency at that time. So you get 10 lear for a, for a private, 
20 year for an NCO, which is a commanding officer, uh, uh, or it's, a, it's a, a non-commissioned officer, officer, and then 50 lear for an officer. And so um, that's one reason why they used these uh, like flashbang type grenades because they were Stunning. very loud, but they wouldn't kill as many people. But they would go in and, and they would just like destroy. Um, wow. So not to mention that there was compensation also for capturing enemy weapons, ranging from uh, between five to 500 lear, depending on the weapon sizes and calibers. Uh, the RDT seized 3,600 prisoners, 63 machine guns, and 26 pieces of artillery over, their co- over the course of the war. Um, so, uh, that's an in- interesting incentive. You just, if you go get that piece of artillery, you're going to get a big payday and it's almost yeah. like a bounties. They're out for bounties. Yeah. Almost, you know, <clears throat> um, it's like you're about to stab someone and you're like, wait, let me look at your shoulder. And it's like, you're an officer. Ah, oh, you need to save your life. And you're just like, Oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is too, when you're only armed with knives, I mean, you can't, you can't save, you, you have to, I mean, you can't take everyone hostage because yeah. there's not, you know, you can't. Can't be outnumbered, you know. Yeah. Unless, yeah, unless you capture their guns too. <laughs> well, that's and that's one thing too. They would capture guns and they could Some potentially use those. Yeah. So, um, another thing that was really interesting was as their their losses They're basically like pirates, dude. Yeah, kind of <laughs> <laughs> swinging down from the ropes with the knife between their teeth. <laughs> yeah. Um, as their losses and personnel grew, new soldiers. So as they lost men, obviously, because this was pretty dangerous. Uh, new soldiers were assigned to our DT units by recommendation only. Uh, before they could officially join the R- and become an RDT, um, they had to complete a specialized school that mimicked the dangers and conditions of the front lines. The fatality rates among the recruits were extremely high due to the realistic training methods. Oh, no so way. So a lot of these people would die... During training, training yeah. because it was so realistic, uh, which That's is kind of crazy. Yeah, um, it wasn't until the Battle of Vittorio Veneto. Uh, can you imagine being in training and like being like, I'm gonna die if I? Yeah, I could die in training. Yeah, in 1918, when the Arditi made the largest impact on the war, said a dozen Arditi units combined, making two monstrance assault assault divisions. The brave men led one another in a forceful charge on the Austro-Hungarian, Austro- Austro-Hungarian forces, resulting in a climatic victory. Um, which is kind of interesting. I read this other thing, and the Austro-Hungarian forces, they had these, they called them stormtroopers. Mm-hmm. And it was like the RDT versus the stormtroopers. They had these, the the other side basically, which is like the, the Germany and, and, and that side, they had um, these kind of commandos on their own side, and it was the RDT versus them in, in, well, and that's when in they this had, battle. And the trench warfare, that's when you had the trench brass knuckles with like a spike on them. Yeah. They had a bunch of brass knuckle type weapons back then, like a, I think it's called a trench knife. It's on, on the hilt, it's a brass knuckles, and then it had a, a, a spike or sometimes a, a blade coming out on one side. Mm hmm. Um, so although the RDT was disbanded in 1920, their bravery, patriotism, and the impact on the Great War lives on in Italian military history and historical that's cool. lore. So that's, that's really cool. cool. Yeah. That's, that's a cool one. Um, and the thing is, I was looking too, uh, I might throw a picture up uh, um, on our Instagram or something like that of some of these RDT soldiers, uh-huh. but you can see them and they've all got, I mean, they've got knives in their mouth and they're all laying there and they're in like big groups and stuff. And there's like pictures and everything of these guys. Oh, wow. Interesting. So one of the <clears throat> ones I'm going to cover is actually, it's very modern day. Um, this is something called Havana syndrome. Have you heard of this? No, maybe. So Havana syndrome is a set of medical signs and symptoms reported by U S United States, and Canadian embassy staff in Cuba dating back to late 2016, as well as subsequently in some other countries, uh, including the United States. So in 2017, President Trump accused Cuba of these unspecified attacks, which caused several symptoms. Uh, The embassy was actually reduced to only minimal staff because of these attacks. Uh, And then in 2018, there were some U.S. diplomats in China that reported similar symptoms to the Havana syndrome. So what exactly is it? So 
basically the health problems typically had a sudden onset. So the victim would suddenly begin hearing strange grating noises uh, that they perceived are as coming from a specific direction, almost like like a boo in their ear. Um, some of them experience it as a vibration or as a sensation comparing comparable to driving a car with the windows partly down. You know, like if you're driving on the highway, it's like, one, it's, like, it's, like a, it's like a vibration. Uh, the duration of these noises range from 20 seconds to 30 minutes and always happened while the diplomats were either at home or in hotel rooms. Other people nearby, family members and guests in neighbor rooms did not report hearing anything. Even as recent as May 2021, there have been reports of this happening in D.C. Over 40 government officials had been hit by these attacks. So the effects are, uh, they've looked at these folks in MRIs and they've done lots of studies uh, to show that these people have experienced brain damage. Uh, Lower amounts of white matter and gray matter volumes were present in the victims. The symptoms include nausea, severe headaches, fatigue, dizziness, sleeping problems, even hearing loss. And so... You know, we opened, we, we, the, President Obama opened back up Cuba, and then we sent a bunch of our bunch of people into our embassy, and then all these things started happening. These people started getting real sick, and, and, and so people were trying to figure out what in the heck is happening, you know? Where is this coming from? What is it? What, what could it be? So the, the State Department declared that the health problems were either the result of an attack or due to exposure to a yet unknown device and declared that they were not blaming the Cuban government, but would not say who was to blame. So, Oh, uh, geez. Um, affected individuals describe symptoms such as hearing loss, memory loss, and nausea. Uh, speculation centered around sonic weapons. So with some researchers pointing to infrasound as a possible cause. So there's some debate on this. Uh, a 2018 study published in the, Nas- in the Journal of Neural Computation uh, by... by Beatrice Alexandra Golomb, uh, Golomb uh, rejected the idea that a sonic attack was a source of the symptoms and concluded that the facts were consistent with pulsed radio frequency microwave radiation or RFMW exposure at the source of injury. Others claim that this is a case of psychogenic or psychosomatic causes like mass hysteria. Everybody's just like, oh, you know, they're all getting psyched up. I have these, I have those symptoms too. Oh my gosh, we're being attacked, and they, and they just all kind of do that. Uh, some think it's, uh, it is from pesticides. Uh, the embassy had recently been sprayed for Zika virus, and some of the chemicals used to spray could have caused these traumas in the brain. Um, you know, they they have no idea. Uh, it's a mystery what it is, but there's people definitely that are suffering from this, and so. I thought this was such an interesting story that we don't know what even is causing this. Um, there's been debate back and forth on, on what it could be, but it is a mystery. And, and it was such a, a big issue to where they did a, a big study on it. Uh, they they pulled out every non-essential person from the embassy in Cuba. So kind of, I don't know what the weapon is, but it's pretty wild. Yeah, I don't know, like hidden, hidden speakers or something in the hotel rooms or... I don't know, some, some kind of pin, pinpoint or, something, yeah. Yeah, crazy. It's yeah. weird that they would potentially have technology like that 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 we don't wouldn't know about or wouldn't know what it is or I mean, I bet we I bet the government's got technology beyond what we can even comprehend. Well, yeah, I know, but you think they would understand what this is then? <laughs> yeah, you think. Know. Who knows, man? It's crazy, isn't it? Interesting. Um one that I had that I thought was pretty cool is um it's about cats. Okay. Oh, the, the, I think I talked about that one. The cat bodyguards? No, this, so this one's a little bit different. So this one, right, well, yeah, maybe in the... Uh, the Battle of Pelusim? Pelusim, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, this is... Uh, I'll go into that one. Um, unless... No, you will you, no, that I'll what, just, was that I'll one just comments. Um, so basically, animals have, have been used throughout history... Um, in, in, in warfare for several different reasons. You know, they're like horses and even elephants and lots of different things were, were used. Dogs are used all the time. Um, but uh, in, in this one, um, it was a, a uh, let's say. It was a battle between Egypt and the Persia. Yeah, called the Battle of Pelusium in 525 B.C. Um 
And as we all know, that cats were very, uh, they were held very high highly in the Egyptian culture and society, and they were actually even sacred creatures. They were like their deities were, were cats. Um, and so the, um, uh, the uh, Achaemenid Empire, which is the ones who were fighting against the Egyptians at that time, um, sought to use this to their advantage. Um, so this, this leader, um, his name was Cambyses, ordered the men to paint cats on all of their shields, and he brought in hundreds of, of uh, actual cats into the front lines. Um, and basically the plan worked. The Egyptian archers, they refused to fire onto the front lines or onto into the enemy because they had fear of injuring these cats, which injuring a cat at this time was a crime punishable by death. Yeah. And so they basically... Um, they instead of firing on the these these uh, army that was coming at them, they decided to retreat, and the the Persians um, actually came in and were able to destroy them because just that psychological warfare of they didn't want to kill the cats. Talk about know your enemy, right? Yeah, I mean, know their weaknesses, know how the how to play them, and then that's such a funny thing, like painting cats on your. <laughs> on your I think shields. that's funny that we both thought it, we both found yeah. the same one and we're like, oh, that's so cool. Let me let me say one about the dogs. Um, yeah, go ahead. The Soviet anti-tank dog suicide dogs. So in the 1930s, the dogs were outfitted with the Soviet Union were outfitted with explosive vests in order to have them run under the enemy tanks and explode under the soft underbelly of the tank. So the thing is that the, the Soviets would train these dogs and they would feed them under the Soviet tanks. Uh, but Soviet tanks used diesel fuel. Nazi tanks used gasoline. Oh yeah. So whenever they would say go, and there was a remote detonator on the on the dogs. So they'd probably maybe starve the dogs and make them a little bit hungry. Yeah. And uh, and they would say go eat, and then point to the the German uh, or, or the German tanks, but the dogs could smell the diesel fuel, and they would say, oh. They could smell, I associate the smell of diesel fuel with food, <laughs> and that's under the Soviet tanks. So they would go under the Soviet tanks, which, which would create an issue, a possible explosion issue, and obviously there was a remote detonator. So uh, that idea was quickly dropped. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> but uh, pretty, Good idea. Yeah, but pretty funny. Uh, well, another one I had was, um, you just, when we were talking about cat body markets, you reminded me of an ancient one. Uh, one from long ago. I forgot who it was or what the context was, but essentially there was two armies, and one of them, uh, they, uh, there were there was this guy that was like really outnumbered, and he, um, it was like the middle of the, they had been fighting, 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 and he had run out of arrows. And in the middle of the night, he's like, "Oh man, we're out of, we're gonna we'll start sounding the war drum, June, June, like we're gonna attack." And they were just playing fake, you know to just see what they would do. And then the uh, enemy shoots a ton of arrows over, shoots a ton of arrows. And they went and collected all the arrows and like, okay, now we got enough arrows. And then, uh, so they did some fighting the next day and then they took a rest and that night, and then the next night, they did it again. Because they needed more arrows. And the enemy didn't wake up because they're like, oh, it's just fake again. It's a fake attack. And they're like, well, let's go get them. And so they went and <laughs> they killed them. <laughs> they killed them <laughs> because they didn't get up. So I thought that was so funny. That's, that's funny. So I had uh, one, a lot of these are about, well, I had another one about animals. So this is kind of cool. Um, this one's about birds. So um, Harold Sigurdsson uh, ruled Norway during the 11th century. Uh, perhaps his most notorious act was a method in which he used um, birds uh, to uh, take this particular city. So, um, he, he it said that he didn't have particular time to uh, really plan out this big siege, and it was this big city that was a walled city, and it was gated, and you couldn't get in. Really high walls. Um, but one day he noticed that uh, flocks of birds that nested in the city would come out to the countryside and to to feed during the day. So they would fly out to the country and to the lakes and all this other kind of stuff, and they would. Um, scavenge through the countryside for food and for worms and for, you know, I don't know, animals or whatever else that they would eat. So uh, what he did 
is that he sent out his men to trap as many birds as possible during the day while they were out in the countryside. So they captured as many as they could. And then he attached with a string, he attached um, uh, uh, wooden chips to their legs. And then what he did when it came time for kind of the evening for the birds when they go back home and they go back into their nests in the city, um, he uh, lit the wood on fire. So it's like a burning ember that's tied to the bird's legs. Uh And so the birds, they flew back in, sat in their nests that were dry and caught their nests on fire. And basically um, the entire city started just going crazy and the mayhem that came from the city, the whole city basically was burning down in different places and everything. And so all the soldiers were trying to 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 put out, put out the fires and everything, and then he was able to attack during the mayhem and the distraction, and he was able to c- take over the city. That's cool. Yeah, that's the next the <laughs> next level thinking, man. I love this how like in in war and stuff, it's almost like you have to think outside the box, and that's how you a lot of times you can achieve victory is just by thinking outside the box. Yeah. Even if you're outnumbered or the odds are are against you. Sometimes it just takes some thinking, out of the box thinking. Yeah, and it's not. I mean, obviously, there's several ways to do it. Technology is one, but just thinking, out, thinking differently, or thinking outside the box is is another, like painting cats on your shields. You know, that's not any new technology. That's just thinking differently and using their your enemy's beliefs maybe against them. Here's another one. This here's another one. These are more of like technology. Uh, so, the, have you ever heard of the the claw of Archimedes? No. So the Claw of Archimedes is a weapon designed by Archimedes to defeat to defend Syracuse uh, this wall city walls from amphibious assault. So it is described as a sort of crane that would be like a gra- with a with a grappling hook. And basically, when a ship would come up to it, it was like a think of like a big crane. It would go, reach down, it would grab the front of the ship, raise it out of the water, even either tip it over or just let it slam back down on the water. And so they were basically lifting ships a part of the ship out of the water and just flipping it over. Just like over the wall? Yeah, it, it was like a big crane. Think about like a big crane with like a lever lever system. Yeah, yeah. They would just reach down, grab their stuff, flip it over, and like grab their hull, lift it way out of the water, and then drop it because it was, it was a big uh-huh. levered, big crane on the Interesting. other side. And so that was kind of a cool thing. Huh. I have another one from kind of ancient world. So this is during the Ottoman Empire. Uh, there was the conquest of Constantinople in 1453. Uh, the invading Turks faced a major challenge. So the, the Byzantines had erected a giant chain across the Golden Horn. So the, the chains were used to to protect uh, harbors and whatnot back in that day. Uh, and this was it stretched all the way across the water, uh, connecting Constantinople uh, to the sea. And so the chain effectively blocked the Ottoman navy from making their way to the enemy capital. And so, because what it would do is it would, it, it would destroy your ship and it would hold you up if you had to, if you got to it and you were trying to cut the thing so your other ships could get through. They could uh, they would fire attack, arrows they would and stuff at you easily and stuff. So, it was a big deterrent. Um, pretty interesting. And if you look, uh, there's actually in some of the old churches around there they have those chains that still exist. Um, you can look and see the, see the chains and stuff. But there was this one captain in order to overcome the chains. The Ottomans moved their navy over land. They moved their boats over land using roll, log rollers. So he took his whole navy and he moved his ships over land to another body of water that allowed the Ottomans to bypass the chain and attack the Byzantines from multiple fronts, ultimately aiding in the capture of the city that's now called Istanbul. Hmm. Isn't that cool? He's like, you know what? My boats can't make it through this chain. I'm so going we'll over land. Him. Apparently, the legend is that he did this in one night. And uh, jeez, so it, it's pretty wild um, that that was that's kind of a unique tactic, you know. Yeah. I'm going to take these boats over land. You know, you can, you can think about that like the brainstorming session. Like, what? How can we get over this? How can we get in there? Any ideas? Like, no idea is so st- is, is stupid. And some guys like, what, what we, if we took our boats like over oh, land? And he's why like, why don't we carry them? <laughs> That might actually be crazy enough to work, you know? <laughs> it's just wild. Um, here's another one that's re- really interesting. It's about uh, Benjamin Franklin. And um, so during the, the um, 
I think it was a Revolutionary War is whenever uh, the British hired uh, Haitian mercenaries from Germany to come and to fight for them. Oh, yeah. Um, Benjamin Franklin spoke many different languages. German was one of them. So Benjamin Franklin, um, basically what he did is he distributed flyers that he wrote um, in German, and these flyers were forged to resemble uh, stolen commands written by the Haitian uh, count or like the leader of the Haitian, the the German mm-hmm. uh, mercenaries. mercenaries, basically to their battlefield commanders. And the message ordered an increase of casualties basically so that the Haitians could uh, receive more payments from the British for more mercenaries and in hopes that the mercenaries that were there basically would be defeated or that they would desert. So basically what they were, what he wrote was, he and he passed these out to kind of discreetly so that the Haitians would get them and they'd read it and it says, hey, not enough Haitians are dying because the 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 Haitian uh, government or whatever wants more money, so more of our soldiers, paid soldiers, need to die so that the British can pay us more money. Yeah, so then they're at so that then they like desert. Yeah, Americans. so that way the Haitian soldiers who are on the battlefield are like, what the heck? You just want to kill more of us so that you can get more money? Yeah. And it's just like just so discouraging that psychological. Yeah, warfare. So that they're like, what the heck? I'm not going to do this. If you all all you do is we want money, so that you want me to die so you can get more money? Heck no. Yeah. And because uh, I think there was like a, a certain if one if a Haitian soldier died, the British paid a, an extra amount to the Haitian government. Um. Huh. Well, we, talked so, about, we talked about the uh, the bread maker for George Washington, yeah, and how he was an advocate for the the Haitian dissenters, and he would uh, speak to the Haitian prisoners about how great America was and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, and so it's just like that's that, funny that little trickery, you know. It's like oh, I'm going to forge a note to they see <laughs> it and they, they feel discouraged. That's so um, funny. Uh, here's another one: Greek fire. So this was a concoction of nafatha and quicklime. It made Greek fire super deadly. So, actually, the recipe is actually a secret. I think it's been lost to history. But it would ignite whenever it hit water and become very deadly. So, the exact recipe, like I said, is a secret. But it's, it is expected or thought to have been a, in a mixture of petroleum, pit, sulfur, pine, resin, lime, and bitten, bitumen. So, uh, what they would do is they would just right up to your ship and then basically it's like a flamethrower they would spit this out at you and it would hit the water ignite and it burn your ship to the ground i mean crazy you know kind of like the chinese inventing uh uh gunpowder yeah uh it's just wild huh um my last one here that i have is uh, uh this one is more more modern right have you ever heard of um the the wandering souls of vietnam no, I don't think so. I so in the Vietnam War, uh, the Vietnamese people in the North Viet Cong who we were fighting, um, they were very superstitious people, and they believed that if many of them believed that if a person died, that they needed to be buried in their homeland, um, or uh, if they didn't, then basically their soul was doomed to a painful wandering for eternity. Um, and so uh, to exploit this belief, the U S army, uh, employed operation wandering soul, which was uh, a production of a spooky soundtrack that was supposed to sound like ghosts called the ghost tape number 10, which they broadcasted overhead by helicopters during the Vietnam war. So basically when it was all quiet and they, they would, um, broadcast through speakers from helicopters and from camps Uh spooky music of like like wandering souls Uh because it would freak out the north Viet Cong because they felt like it was their their fallen comrades that had that that, there was like their belief that their souls were wandering do you think well if you're a helicopter of, of overhead you're gonna hear the helicopter right uh i mean depending there might they might be able to like point sounds in certain directions or whatever. I don't know. It, is that had just to, something that we tried or is that something that was actually effective? No, it was something that they did. Yeah. Was it, did it actually make a difference? Uh, I'm 
I'm sure it probably did. They did a lot of psychological stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it probably didn't, like, in the middle of battle, it probably didn't, but I'm sure if they... It was just yeah. trying to, to freak him out. Yeah, I think there's a lot of superstitious stuff like that. Or, or keep him awake at night, maybe? Yeah. Well, they do that quite a bit, man. They'll, they'll play blare music at you to keep you awake. I mean, you talk about all the tactics they use, the people in Waco. Yeah. With lights and, and loud lights music. And, and, and Just keeping him awake, sleep deprivation. I mean, you're... Yeah. Those are crazy. There, there's so many out there that it's just interesting how, you know, humans have adapted using u- unique techniques to fight war uh, not just guns, but like other technologies and, uh, you know, from Archimedes lever to whatever they're using and that's causing the Havana syndrome, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, just wild. Well, I, I, I don't know. We probably could have kept going on this for a couple hours on cool stories like this. Uh, maybe we'll have to do another episode of, of new ones. Um, but this has been great. This is kind of those things that we like to explore new things and to, to see what's out there. Um, and if you have any uh, suggestions or you have any ideas or, or uh, like uh, stories that you've heard, we'd love to hear them. Um, maybe we'll have you on a, as a guest yeah. on the, the Yeah, or if you'd like us to podcast. research anything, yeah. Yeah. We'd love to look into that or if you have any episode ideas. So, well, let's build that creed together. All right, let's do it. Yeah.